about Filecoin and about FEM. And then I'm going to do two demos. So the first one is about uh, publishing a NFT uh, to Filecoin and just like a more general kind of solidity one. And then the second demo is going to be about specifically storage deals and storing storage information. Okay. So, okay. So the FEM project delivers on-chain programmability to the Filecoin network. The Filecoin network has been running about two years now and stores about 16 exabytes of data uh, globally. So that's uh, about 1% of the total data center storage capacity. It's a pretty big network. But what happens now with FEM and FEVM, uh, the Filecoin Ethereum virtual machine, is it now allows you to uh, write smart contracts that interact with that storage economy, that storage market. So the Filecoin master plan, um, and just to say, I'm presenting this actually live from uh, IPFS thing, a conference that's happening in Brussels at the moment. So hopefully it all goes well here and I don't get kicked out of this room. Um, but just uh, just to let you know, there may be occasional people wandering past and, uh, and, and stuff going on. So the Filecoin master plan, uh, step one, build the world's largest decentralized storage network. Step two, onboard and safeguard humanity's data. And then step three, bring compute to the data to enable web scale apps. And that's kind of where we are at now, this compute uh, stage. And FEM is a key part of that. FEM allows you to do logic and computation around the storage deal information. So not the data itself, that's kind of handled off chain uh, through some some other projects, but it enables you to actually do programmability around the uh, data storage contracts. So FEM was launched on mainnet uh, just over a month ago. It was launched on what was known as Pi Day, if you do your dates in American format. So uh, 314, 14th of March uh, was Pi Day, and also the FEM um, chain ID in the Ethereum ecosystem is actually 314 as well. So that was a nice uh, little bit there. And each of the subsequent test nets have an additional digit of pi on, depending upon how uh, sort of how much in development they are. So the main net is 314. Hyperspace, one of our test nets is 3141. And you'll see they, they kind of go on from that. We've got a batch of ecosystem partners that have launched on FEM. So Sealer, um, NFT storage, Axela. So we've got wrapped fill as well. We've got a whole bunch of uh, projects that are building on FEM. There's about 400,000 uh, fill in FEM at the moment in, in contracts uh, as well. The first thing that was launched actually when it went launched was a commemorative NFT uh, that was launched on the network within about six minutes of the network going live. So this was the very first contract that was deployed. And these are just some of the people that have been involved in building FEM. There's actually a whole lot more, but uh, this is just uh, some of them that were involved there. So FEM solidifies Filecoin as the layer one that powers the open data economy. Right. So data is obviously a very important thing in society, getting more and more important, not just data, but verifiable data. And the benefit that you get with Filecoin is you can actually verify the data that you get is the data that you, um, you know, you, you think you have. The data you retrieved is, is really what you you anticipated getting. And FEM allows you to orchestrate where that data is stored. Uh, how it's stored, how it's governed. You can create things like data DAOs that create governance structures around the storage of data and, and funding models. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And so now any developer, so yourselves, uh, can deploy smart contracts directly onto the Filecoin network and build these new uh, applications for, for Filecoin. So the storage market, about 14 billion US dollars, retrieval about 25 billion compute is orders of magnitude more, 300 billion. So that's kind of really the direction we're going there. And FEM is one of like the critical updates to uh, critical upgrades to the Filecoin network, right? Up until now, you've been able to put data on the network and retrieve data, but now you're able to actually kind of deal with the, the processing of that data as well. So the architecture of FEM, and uh, it is a polyglot 
uh, virtual machine, multiple language virtual machine, it's VM agnostic. So what we have are some native actors at the top left of this diagram here. So these are built-in system actors, and I'll talk a little bit about them later, that control some of the uh, innate functions of Filecoin. Then there'll be the ability to do user-defined WebAssembly actors. Those are not live yet. But what we do have is the Ethereum uh, virtual machine. And so that's what's on the on the right here. And this is the first of our kind of like foreign runtimes. And that is the EVM compatible, you know, the Ethereum style virtual machine. So this allows you to come along to Filecoin and use your existing knowledge you might have from developing on top of Ethereum and other EVM compatible blockchains. So you can use all the same tools. and I'll give you some demo of that as well. So like I said, for the first time ever, developers are able to actually interact with the Filecoin protocol. So they can take Solidity stuff that gets compiled down and then executed against the built-in actors on the network. And the way that works is Lotus, which is the reference implementation of the Filecoin protocol, actually supports the Ethereum JSON RPC API. So that means you have immediate uh, compatibility with Hard Hat Remix, Foundry, um, uh, Metamask, for example, anything that uses an Ethereum style RPC endpoint will work with Filecoin. I mentioned that there are some built in actors. So these actors are, are listed here. These are the actors, what, what we call actors are what you might be called like smart contracts uh, in other, other languages. So these built in actors actually manage the uh, intrinsic nature of uh, the Filecoin functionality. So things to do with the storage miners and dealing with storage proofs. So with Filecoin, when a storage provider stores some data, every 24 hours they've got to prove they've still got that data. So they have to solve a zero knowledge proof challenge. And if they aren't able to solve that, they start getting their stake slashed. So there's a number of actors that deal with things like uh, the escrow of funds, deal with the, the proofs that come back from the miners and deal with things like slashing stake if they don't uh, if they don't provide uh, that that proof back. So what sort of things can you build? So here's a couple of examples, uh, things like perpetual storage of NFTs. Uh, it's a project you may be familiar with, Lighthouse, and I'm going to talk a bit about them as well uh, later on. And uh, Lighthouse, for example, do uh, perpetual storage. So you can build things like that on top of um, on top of FEM. So you might have, say, an NFT collection, and you want to create a endowment fund that automatically renews the storage deal for that uh, over time. So like a data DAO, where you might have participants that get some voting rights to vote on what is stored and for how long and for how much, for example. Uh, clients for that might be something like a, a science DAO that is storing uh, scientific data, for example. And then another one is Filecoin staking. So up until now, uh, there's not been a huge amount you can do with a Filecoin token if you just hold it. But in order to set up as a storage provider, you need to provide a certain amount of the Filecoin token as collateral when you when you set up. And that's in proportion to the size of the amount of storage you are offering to the network. So that can be actually a fairly substantial amount uh, that you have to put up as a, as a storage provider. So with Filecoin staking, we can have a system where individuals, you and I, can stake our Filecoin token, our fill tokens, in a smart contract, and then those fill tokens be loaned out to storage providers and they may pay a fee for that and you know the holders of the token would get that fee in terms of an interest uh, payment back to them for example so what are people building um nft storage you've possibly come across them before they are a, a storage system that use ipfs and filecoin and they're looking to automate uh some of their processes as well and make it a little bit more decentralized in what they're doing. Uh, so they're using smart contracts to automatically renew and repair storage deals. They've got a project called NFT Forever that is a, a, a system that will automatically renew storage deals going forward. Glyph, this is a staking pool. So this is what I've just talked about in terms of allowing storage providers to borrow uh, fill from the network as well. So you can stake it and a storage provider can borrow it. And what's really unique with Filecoin is that the network is able to actually check what storage capacity and what storage deals a miner has. 
So a smart contract can actually see what future revenue a storage provider might have based upon what storage deals they have agreed to, right? Because storage deals might vary from, say, six months to two years. And the fee that is paid for the storage is paid out to the miners incrementally over that time period. So if they've got a two-year storage deal, they'll be paid the fee slowly over those two years. But a smart contract could actually look and see, okay, well, what is the future revenue that this miner has coming in? And the miner could actually agree for that revenue to go directly to the smart contract and the smart contract to actually uh, deal with the repaying of that loan, for example. Uh, Saturn. So Saturn is a Web3 CDN content distribution network that accesses IPFS and, and soon Filecoin as well. And the Saturn individual Saturn nodes, if you run a node, which you can do yourself, if you run a node, you'll be paid uh, in fill token for running a node on the network. They've just been moving all of their payment infrastructure into FEM as well, FEVM. So they're writing smart contracts that allow node operators to go and claim their rewards directly from a smart contract. Uh, DeFi staking and loans, again, similar kind of thing, allows you to actually loan, to, to borrow, uh, feel kind of similar to DeFi on, on other chains as well. Perpetual storage, I mentioned about that, Lighthouse. Uh, so Lighthouse have been doing perpetual storage using other blockchains, and now they're able to actually do that directly on Filecoin as well and create smart contracts that will automatically renew the storage deals over time. Data DAOs, Lagrange and Spend DAO, they are both uh, uh, data DAOs to deal with science data, so scientific data sets, some of which might be extremely large. For example, I was talking to somebody just yesterday here at this conference in Brussels that is dealing with vast amounts of satellite imagery data. And so they want to create something like this, like a data DAO to store that satellite imagery data and pay for its access and also deal with like gated access. So you could do something like NFT gating that would control things like uh, decryption keys to decrypt the data that you have access to. And another interesting one is a, there's a project called Bakayao. So I mentioned that Filecoin deals with story, uh, Filecoin FEM can access the deal, storage deal information, but can't access the raw data. Now, it, it makes sense when you think about it that Filecoin is designed for storing like gigabytes of data and you don't want to be loading gigabytes of data into a smart contract, the gas fees would just be too high. So most of the computation happens off chain. And Bakayao is a decentralized project uh, or a project for doing decentralized compute. And connected with FEM, you can then do things like uh, create a compute job using FEM. And that is then passed off via a bridge. They've got a bridge called Lilypad. And Lilypad is a bridge between FEM and the Bakiao compute system. So you can go and run a job on Bakiao, the results can get stored back and then get posted back to a smart contract on Filecoin. I mentioned MetaMask. So you can use MetaMask directly with Filecoin and I'll show you how to do that in the demo that's, that's coming up uh, shortly. And similarly, Remix, I'm gonna use Remix as well. So you get a, a flavor for that. Um, many of you may have already used some of these tools with other uh, Ethereum developments. Similarly, Hardhat. So one thing to note here is that Filecoin, like I mentioned, we have this foreign runtime now, this Ethereum runtime on Filecoin. Now, Filecoin addresses typically started with an F on the mainnet or T on a testnet. And the address is normally started F0, um, or sorry, F1 or F3 for user accounts. So if you tried to deposit some funds uh, to something like a Ledger Nano or get stuff on and off of you know, Coinbase or something like that, then you're probably used to addresses that start either F1 or F3. In order to support these foreign address schemes from these foreign runtimes, we created a new address class called F4. And the F4 is a delegated address class that delegates to an address manager. So in this case, the Ethereum address manager sits at ID 10. So every address that starts F4.10 is a Filecoin address that can be directly translated into an Ethereum style address and back again. 
So you see the example at the bottom below, there's an F4 address and a 0x address. Those are the same address. So you'll sometimes see, and you'll see later on in one of the demos, where I have to convert from one to the other just because a uh, hard hat or MetaMask are expecting a 0x address, yet some of the Filecoin native tooling expects an F4 address, for example. We have a series of Filecoin Solidity libraries uh, by one of our partners called Zondax. So Filecoin.sol is a Solidity library that gives you access to a number of those built-in actors that I that I mentioned. So a lot of the functionality that you do will be involving this Filecoin Solidity library. So that's it for kind of like the background of, of Filecoin. I don't know if anybody has any questions at the moment. If you have any questions, please put them in the in the chat and I will get to them kind of as we go along. And then um, I'm going to move on to the demo here. So this is the first demo that I'm going to do and it's a fairly generic uh, Solidity demo. I'm going to upload an NFT image and metadata to NFT storage. I'm going to configure MetaMask to connect to the hyperspace testnet. Uh, I'm going to use Open Zeppelin's contract wizard to create an ERC721 NFT contract. I'm going to deploy that contract to hyperspace using Remix. I'm going to mint an NFT to the account. And I'm actually then going to view that NFT in the Brave wallet because Brave wallet now supports their browser wallet now supports NFTs and um, setting up custom networks. So we can support the hyperspace network. Okay. So. Let's start here. So first of all, we need to upload an NFT image and metadata to NFT storage. So I've got a um, some JavaScript code that I've written here. Uh, well, actually, I took it mainly from the one of the NFT storage examples. But what this uh, script does is it gets my uh, NFT storage token from the environment. I've already uh, set this in an environment variable in this terminal, and uh, we then call a uh, store function and we pass in the metadata. So what this does, this is quite a nice convenience function in that it stores the image that I've got here, IPFS thing.jpg. Uh, the conference I'm at is called IPFS thing. So this is a photo that was taken here just a couple of days ago. So it stores the IPFS thing image in NFT storage, which gives it an IPFS URI, a CID, which is the long hash string. It then inserts that into the metadata JSON file and stores that in turn on NFT storage as well. So it does those two steps. So we have the IPFS URI of the image and the IPFS URI of the metadata. And it's the metadata one that we're going to add into our NFT. So I'm going to run this script, um, node upload IPFS uh, there. And once that is run, it'll give me back an IPFS URI. So there we go. We've got that. And that is stored on uh, NFT storage. If I go to NFT storage and look here in my files section, uh, when it loads up, um, it is here. So ends XXY. I think that's the, the one there. XXY. Yeah. And so that's the metadata information. If I click on that, it will probably uh, load it up so that we can actually see it there. So it's going a little bit slow. Hopefully uh, my network is working okay here. Um, not sure why that's taken a while. There we go. Right. Um, so that brought that up um, there. I can preview that. Ah, I can't get it there. And this, for some reason, this browser is not displaying that. Anyway, you'll you'll see that come through soon enough. Um, that, that then works. So I have stored the data on NFT storage, and I have an IPFS URI. There's a question here uh, saying, if I need to store data on Filecoin for testing, if the contract is working, do I need to set up my own testnet node for that? No, you don't have to set up your own testnet node. So you can use hyperspace. Uh, which is the um, uh, testnet that is used uh, publicly. Um, so I'm going to demonstrate that and show you how to do that, set up hyperspace uh, or access to hyperspace. But you can also as well set up a local node, and that's what I'm going to demonstrate in the second demo. Now, the reason for that being is that when we get onto actually storing data on Filecoin as part of the demo, you'll see that 
if you're doing this on the public network, it's quite difficult to see you're the client storing data, but you can't see the other side of the story. You can't see what storage providers, miners, what they're doing when they accept that data. So by running your own local network, you can play both halves of that conversation and see that. So I'll demo that next. But this demo we're doing on the public test net called Hyperspace. So we've got our uh, data up there. And so the next thing I need to do is actually go ahead and do this is configure MetaMask to connect to the Hyperspace network. And what I can do is I can go to chainlist.org. And um, I mean, I've already got it here, but if you just type in Filecoin and include test nets, you'll see the Filecoin Hyperspace network and you can click connect wallet. And when you do that, um, uh, MetaMask will come up and ask you to confirm it and it'll configure it as a, as a network there. So I've already done it. So if I click on MetaMask now and log in, you'll see um, that I can switch to Falcon Hyperspace, right? And I've got an account there. Now, on this account, I already have some funds there. I've got just short of 500 fill. When you create your um, account in in MetaMask, or if you if you create a, a you know a new account, go in here and, um, uh, and and create a new account, or if you just install MetaMask from scratch, then you're not going to have any funds in your network. So one of the things you're going to need to do is go to the faucet to get funds. So hyperspace.yoga. Don't ask me why the uh, the address is done by a third party of ours, and click on faucet and you'll get the faucet. So you can get your address from MetaMask, choose that, copy that, paste that in there, click I'm human, um, image containing a vinyl. I presume that's these. Well, they could be cameras, hard to tell. Yeah, well, it thinks I'm human. That's good enough. And I hit send, and that's now sending that. So that will send, I think, 250 uh, test fill at a time. So you can see my wallet at the moment. I have just shy of 500 test fill. So you'll soon see um, as we go along, that'll, that'll jump up to uh, just short of 750 test fill. Now, the hyperspace network, like the production network, has a 30-second block time. So it's a bit bit longer than Ethereum's block time. So when you submit something, it'll go into one block, it'll be uh, executed the next block and returned back on the third block. So it'll take between sort of 60 and 90 seconds for the result to come back. Okay. So, but I've got some funds here already, so we can move on. You'll see that jump up in a little bit. So next stage. So we've got MetaMask configured. We've got some funds there. So I now want to use Open Zeppelin and create an ERC seventy one NFT contract. Now Open Zeppelin, if you're not aware, Open Zeppelin is a repository of verified smart contracts, and they've got various ones for different things. Now for NFTs, uh, there's a standard ERC seven twenty one, and that's what I'm going to use here. So I'm going to call this token. Uh, what do we call it here? Uh, Video jam, video jam, EDJ, let's call it. And I'm going to set auto increment IDs and URI storage there. And that's set some defaults there. If we can, uh, yeah, they've just been muted. Okay, good. Right. So we've got a, a base contract here that we can use for an NFT. And I'm going to click Open in Remix. And it's going to open it in Remix. Remix is a web-based IDE. You might have used it already with other um, projects as well. So there we go. Uh, there's a question. Can this data be encrypted? Only selected people can see. So Filecoin data by default, same with IPFS, is unencrypted. It's a public network. Anybody can see the data. If you want to have privacy, you're going to have to encrypt the data yourself before you upload it to the network. And then you're going to have to manage the keys as well. But again, one of the nice things that FEM now gives us is the ability to do uh, logic around that, like key management, for example. 
Okay, I've got this contract here in Remix. I'm going to hit Compile. That is going to compile that um, smart contract. And then what I'm going to do is go down here, and I'm going to pick Injected Provider MetaMask, right? Because I've set MetaMask to point to the hyperspace network. And as you can see, it comes up with the account here and 749. So you see we've had an extra 250 test fill delivered to that network. Contract is video jam, I want to deploy it. So if I hit deploy, MetaMask will come up and ask me to sign the transaction. I sign it and it has now um, submitted it to the network and we now need to just wait for that um, to uh, complete. And that should come back shortly. I think that should, uh, doesn't show the transaction there. Hopefully that has submitted, I think it has. Normally it tells you that it's submitted it and uh, it's waiting on there. So, but I think that has done it. We'll uh, wait a second. Oh, we've got transaction one there. So I think that means that that has been submitted there. So we should shortly see once that's completed, they'll come back with a success message and it'll show up here in deployed contracts. And we can then interact with that NFT smart contract. So just wait for that. It'll be uh, be a moment. Um, while that's doing that, if anybody has any further questions, um, feel free to ask. Okay, well we're, we're back here. There we go. Big green tick. That was successful. You can see here deployed contracts, and we can interact with that now. So I have a function here called Safe Mint, and I can give it the address I want to mint to, and I can give it the URI of the metadata. Now remember, we had the metadata from when we ran. Uh, this command here to upload it to IPFS. So I'm going to take that. I'm going to put that in there. And the address, I'm going to send it to myself. So here, I'm going to copy my address, paste that in, and hit Transact. And again, MetaMask is going to ask me to sign the transaction. I hit Confirm. And that is now sending that. You can see the safe mint, mint is pending. So this is now sending it to the network. Now, I mentioned I have uh, Brave installed. I've got Brave Wallet here. So if I click on my wallet for Brave Wallet, let's have a look in there. See, and with Brave Wallet, uh, I need to switch here to the uh, hyperspace network. You can see we've got the same funds on there because it's the same it's the same network, right? So just shy of 750 TFIL. And you can go in and configure that in Brave. You can configure the the, the network. So if we go down here and go to, um, where is it, the plus icon, uh, we've got Ethereum networks here, and you can choose add. So just a, a note, it's an Ethereum network you're adding, not a Filecoin network. So because that Filecoin network is the original sort of native Filecoin, transactions so but we're dealing with the fem side which the fevm side which is the ethereum style so under ethereum networks you'll see down here we have fem hyperspace and i did that by clicking add and going in and, and filling in the details you can't do it quite as automatically as you can do with metamask but you can take the same details the chain id all of that stuff is is there on chain list and you can do that so if we go back to remix um we can see that transaction has succeeded so we have minted a token. So I want to look at it in my Brave wallet. What I'm going to need to do is I'm going to need to copy in, uh, copy and paste in the address of my smart contract here. So if I go back to uh, wallet, if I go to settings, if I go to my wallet and click NFTs. I need to click import NFT. And I need to choose the network hyperspace, the address, which is there, the token name, GeoJam BDJ, and the token ID, which will be zero. So you can have a token collection, and we've only minted one, so it's the zeroth element on this network. Unfortunately, it doesn't automatically fill in the token name like uh, MetaMask does. Uh, hopefully, Brave will add that soon. Uh, but anyway, I can add all of this, and if, when I click Add, fingers crossed, Yay, it's done. 
So here we go. This is a photo taken at the Comic Museum in Brussels a couple of nights ago uh, here at this IPFS thing conference. And so that is my colleagues, Nikki and Anshuman, uh, there at the conference. So there we go. That is, uh, I think that's the, yeah, that's the, the total of that uh, demo there. So we uploaded an NFT image and metadata to NFT storage. We configured MetaMask to connect to the hyperspace network. We used the Open Zeppelin contract wizard to create an ERC721 NFT contract. Uh, we deployed the contract to hyperspace using Remix. We minted the NFT to my account, and then we imported that NFT contract into Brave Wallet so we could see it. Next demo, brilliant, great. Okay, any any questions on that last one? Uh, if not, I will move on to the next demo here. So, this next demo. Uh, Matt, Does any, Matt, there are a couple yeah. of questions. Oh, sure. If you can answer those. Uh, I can just see the ones about encrypted data that I already asked. Um, and the one about Filecoin for testing. Do I need to set up my own test net node? I think I've answered both of those. Is there some others there? No? Okay. So can anybody recognize this image? Does anybody know this? this cat here. Feel free to put it in the chat or come off a cat, <laughs> a cat. I think Matt has dropped off. I'm just going to get it from back to him. Yeah. I'm just going to ask him to rejoin. Okay, am I back? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Not sure what happened there. Let me reshare my screen again. Okay, can you see my screen still? Yes. Great. So I was asking if anybody recognized this cat. I've got some chat. The cat. Yep. Okay. So it's from Men in Black. So in the film Men in Black, this cat had a uh, galaxy in a little globe around its neck. And that's a metaphor for what we're about to do now. We're about to create the, uh, the, the universe of Filecoin here on a laptop. You recognize the locket, exactly, yes. So this is a uh, local net uh, deal contract demo. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna clone uh, a repository called FEM LocalNet. Uh, it uses Docker to bring up an image to create a new local network. We're then going to use Hardhat to deploy a contract called the deal client contract to this local network. 
We're going to then invoke that deal client contract with details of data to store. So the data that we want to the file coin to store, we're going to uh, tell the contract what we want to store. That contract, that de detail information will be passed to the Filecoin miner with Boost. And then um, we'll be able to go into Boost, pretend to be a miner, and publish that storage deal. And then we'll be able to complete the circle and go uh, using a tool called Lassie, which is uh, this here, uh, to fetch the data from Filecoin. Okay. So let's start here. So first we need to own the FEM local net repo. So there's a project here within the Filecoin uh, organization. So Filecoin project, uh, Filecoin FEM local net. So I need to copy, the, uh, well, I need to go to the code. Uh, do HTTP, copy that. And I need to clone that. So I can type git clone. That will clone that um, and go into that directory. I'll call it FEM local net. And then I just simply type Docker. Oh, sorry, you need to have Docker installed. If you haven't got Docker installed for this to do this locally or wherever you want to run it, um, you'll need to go to uh, Docker and install that. So if you go to Docker, um, docker.com, you can download Docker and install that um, on your on your network. Oh, sorry, on your on your local machine. So I'm going to say Docker Compose up, and it's now going to start up a network. Now, the first time you run this, it needs to download the containers. So or container. The container is about one gigabyte in size. And then when it first starts up, it has to prefetch some parameters to start the Genesis network. Those are about two gigabytes in size. So if you run this, the first time you run it, it'll try and download about three gigabytes of data. So be aware if you are on a network for which that may be an issue, right? So that's now firing that up. Uh, so the Lotus node is starting. And once Lotus node starts, that's the main uh, node for the network. And so once that starts up, you'll then get a Lotus miner starting up. And then once that has started up, so here's the Lotus miner now starting up. Once the Lotus miner has started up, you'll get a piece of software called Boost starting up as well. And Boost is some management software for storage providers, right? So that they can um, uh, see the storage deals and accept the storage deals coming in to the network. So I'll just give this a moment uh, to start up. It's actually generating a new Genesis block and created it. So I've got a question here. What kinds of data can we store on Filecoin? Basically anything. You can store anything on Filecoin. Now, with that caveat, the main Filecoin production network is designed to store large amounts of data. So the main kind of like unit that is used by miners are called sectors. And on the production network, a sector size is 32 gigabytes of data. And the miner is going to want to store some data that is, you know, that order of magnitude. So if your data you're storing on the production network is less than about four gigabytes, they're not going to want to store it and they won't take the storage deal, right? Now, if we're running it locally in this case, so we're running on this local network, the sector size is two kilobytes, right? It means you can't store more than two kilobytes on this network, but it's nice and fast and doesn't have to download much. There is a file, once you've you've cloned this, there is a file called .env, and in there you can comment out to have eight megabyte blocks, and that means you can store up to eight megabytes on your local instance, right? So that'd be a bit more useful, uh, but that eight megabyte, eight megabyte block size requires an initial download of about six gigabytes, right? So again, just be just be aware of that. So in the in the production network and on hyperspace, um, if you're storing your sort of smaller amounts of data, then you might be wanting to go via a storage aggregator uh, instead. So that's the likes of um, uh, Estuary, Web3 Storage, Lighthouse. There's a number of them out there. However, what we're hoping is for this hackathon, this video jam hackathon, you will be making deals on the hyperspace network and the miners there should be taking data from you. And if you're storing video data, you're probably going to be up in the at least certainly, you know, tens, hundreds of megabytes size, um, possibly up to gigabytes as well. Right, Boost has started. 
and we should be able to see that or at least i think it's starting i think it's just waiting to it's just funding there we go it's now started now um so i can go to localhost 8080 and here is the instance of boost here now one thing i'm going to do is i'm going to go down to settings and i'm just going to set the fee down to zero so this is the fee the 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 fee that the miner wants per epoch which is per effectively per uh block time uh so per 30 seconds per gigabyte of data and it's in atto fill right so 10 to the minus 18 i think it is phil but i'm going to set that to zero just because that makes that a little bit easier for the demo but um yeah so miners are, are, are going to want to you know have a fee for storing your your data we're going to set that to zero in this case so we've got a miner up and running um now i'm going to need to switch my network to the local network right and the details for this local network are actually in if you go to that fem uh local net repository the details are actually in the readme that you need there so that's got the chain id and the rpc url so when you go into metamask uh you can go in and add a new network and you can choose uh you can fill it in as filecoin local net and put those details in so i've already done that so if i click filecoin local net it'll switch to my local network now it's a brand new blockchain there's nothing on there yet so i don't have my account doesn't have any funds so the first thing i need to do is send some funds to this wallet address right so i'm going to copy that wallet address and to get funds in there i'm going to actually use one of the filecoin lotus commands to do that right so here on the uh network let's see here uh around here i can do this um now i'm going to need to translate that address into a t4 address or f4 address that lotus can understand so i can run docker compose exec this will run a command in one of the docker images there's a docker image uh, container called lotus and i'm going to say lotus uh, evm stat and i'm going to give it that address and it's going to do the translation and, and check that uh, that is running Okay, that's not running there because I'm in the wrong directory because I've just cloned a new instance of it. So let me just try that again. There we go. It's run this time. So the key thing that we need to know from this is the Filecoin address because we now need to tell Lotus to send some funds to that address. So again, docker compose exec Lotus. That's the Lotus container. And then Lotus again. This is the Lotus command. Send. And I give it that address and I tell it how much to send. So I want it to send a thousand fill. And it's done that and it comes back with the transaction ID, right? But that now means that is sending some uh, funds to my wallet. So if I go back here and look here, this will go up soon. Now, this local net that I'm running has a 15 second block time. So it's twice as fast as the network running in production um so it will take you know th between 30 and 45 seconds for that transaction to show up here and then we should have like i said a thousand t fill delivered to this wallet for this local network which then allows us to then uh do transactions so i'll just wait for that there we go a thousand t fill so that's been delivered to that account now so what do we want to do next? We've got that. Um, now we want to use the, uh, we're going to use hard hat to deploy the deal client contract to local net. Now this deal client contract comes from, there's a hard hat starter kit um, here. So let me just uh, hard hat. Uh, here we go. So in the FEM, in, in the Falcon project, there's a, a project here called FEM hard hat kit. And within there, some contracts and basic deal client. This is what we're using here, dealclient.sol. Now, what I've actually done is I've edited the um, the script to uh, remove some of the other things that it was going to deploy. So we just deploy this just for the, the, the sake of this demo um, there. So let me just see here. I think I've got that open here. Yeah, I've got that open here. So I can type 
yarn hard hat deploy and it's now going to deploy that to my address now i've set my private key um, in an environment variable so it's an environment variable called private underscore key and so you need to go into um, metamask go into here and go to the three dots here account details and if you click export private key um, it'll ask you for your password and come up with your private key on the test network and you need to put that into the variable called private key so that's deployed now so we have this deal client contract deployed to our local network so the next thing we're going to want to do is interact with that contract so what do we want to do we're going to want to tell that contract to go and fetch some data from somewhere and store it on filecoin now we need to give it a certain number of parameters we need to package that data up now we can do that manually there's a set of commands we can do that manually or we can actually use a tool by lighthouse uh, their data onboarding warehouse, right? So we can go to, uh, I think I've already got it open here. Uh, here we go, yes, data.lighthouse.storage and log in there with your GitHub account and you can now upload a file to that. So let's create a, a file here. Um, I'm just gonna, uh, let me just drop down a directory. Um, so I'm going to create a file and I'm going to call it video jam.txt. And again, this is a, a two kilobyte network, so I can't store a huge amount here. So I'm just going to store, you know, hello world video jam is amazing. There we go. Build cool stuff. All right. And that video jam.txt file, we're going to now upload to the data warehouse so upload new file select from there and video jam.txt and that is uploaded now what that does is i can go here and i can see video jam.txt now what it has done is it has packaged that file up into what's called a car file c-a-r so a car file is it's a bit think of it a bit like a zip file but it's the format that Filecoin uses for storing data. So any data you store on Filecoin, you have to first of all convert into a into a car file to store. And it's done that, and it's given us a few bits of information we need when interacting with the contract. So we need things like what's called the piece CID, the payload CID, and we need the size of the car file and the size of the piece that's there as well. So with Filecoin, you can have individual files that then get uh, aggregated into what's called a piece which is a, you know, a larger kind of aggregate archive. Um, and uh, that is then padded out slightly as well. So you see the car file is 245 bytes. It gets padded out to get the piece size of 256 bytes because it has to be a power of two uh, for the, the proof data to work. Anyway, all you need to know is that the information you need is here on this screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug that into the command. I've actually got the command in a text file here just to make that a little bit easier. So some things we need. We need the contract address. So we have that from when we deployed the contract, which is, uh, which one did we do that? Here. So deal client contract, I can copy that and paste that in there. I need the PCID. So again, I can get that from here, PCID. I can put that there. Oh, just copied it by mistake. Let me do that again. PCID. Paste that there. We need the piece size, which is 256. We need the label, that's actually the root CID or the payload CID, so I need to copy that and put that in there. Oh, I've just done the same thing again, copied again, payload CID, paste that in there, there we go. The start epoch and the end epoch. This is the, the block height at which this contract should go live. Now, it needs to be a little way in the future. So when we just started this off, we had a block height of zero, and it would be going up every 15 seconds. So I'm going to set it to 2000. 
And then you need the end epoch, which is a certain amount in time as to when this storage deal will end. Uh, the price per epoch is zero, because remember we said that uh, our storage provider doesn't need a you know a cost here. So the provider collateral is zero, the client collateral is zero. We need here the location reference of where uh, the storage provider can get this data from. And it's in the data depot down here. I can copy that. And I can paste that in there. And then we need the car size finally, which is uh, 245. Oh, I think I've got that all right. Car size 245, piece size 256, got the PC ID, the contract the CID, location reference. Yeah, I think that's that's all of it there. So let's copy all of that. And we can now paste that command here. And that is going to execute that command against that smart contract, right? So that is making a deal proposal on the local network. What that is doing is it's interacting with the smart contract. The smart contract will emit an event on the net, on the blockchain, and that event is being listened to by the miners on the blockchain. Now, remember, we're running this all locally on my laptop in some Docker images. So that piece of software boost that I showed you at the start will be listening for this deal to come in, right? So if we uh, go back to boost here, we'll see under storage deals, uh, we'll see that it finds out about this storage deal and it will then show up here once that goes through, right? Oh, there we go, it's there. So the deals come through with a deal ID and it tells you what it's doing. So it's transfer is queued. So it is queued to try and download the data from that original URL from the data depot, that we, which is where we put it. Now, because it's only a small file, um, it shouldn't take very long for that to come down. So it's done that, and it now says it's ready to publish. If I click on the deal ID, you can actually scroll down and see everything that's happened here. So it received a request on the network. Um, it tagged some funds that were needed. Again, we didn't need any funds, so that's all zero. Um, so it did the database, the deal into the database, started the execution, started the deal transfer. So it's using HTTP to, to fetch it. Um, does a bunch of stuff here. Um, checks various things. So I think called the COMP, that's the piece CID that we had before, checks to make sure that everything's the, the, the same, right? So when we submitted to the smart contract, we said, you know, this is the CID of our data and it's now gone and fetched it. And it's make sure that those two things do actually match up, right? And because the CIDs are a hash of the data, that then means you can be sure that the data hasn't been tampered with, right? So we, we, we know that even though we just stored that data on this data warehousing site, that that data warehousing site hasn't tampered with that data at all. Uh, so it's come down here and the date, the deal is ready to be published. So, um, and I can see all of these things as well, just to let you know, if we go back to this terminal here, we can see all of this uh, will have gone on here on this terminal. We'll see a bunch of stuff from Boost um, saying that the deals come in. Uh, we can see all of that there. You can also, because there's the, the logs from the miner and everything, if you just want the ones from Boost, for example, you can actually get those uh, from here. So um, you can say, uh, let me just clear that, Docker, compose logs, Boost. And it will give you the logs just from, from Boost there. Um, and so you can see what it's doing. You can put dash F on the end and it will um, uh, continue on there as well. Right. So we've got a deal. What do we do now? Well, now we play the part of the storage provider, the miner, and we need to publish it. So it says it's ready to publish. So I can go down here to publish deals and I can say publish now. So that's now going to start publishing that deal. And if we go back to the deal and look here, you'll see the progress of that as to what it's doing. Um, the deal has been published and it's now waiting for confirmation. So when that deal is published, what it's doing is it's telling the blockchain, I've got the data, I've checked it all out, I'm, I've agreed on the price, everything's good, I'm going to store the data. So it now reports that back to the blockchain. All right. And then the next thing that happens once that's confirmed back is the miner will then what's called seal the data, which puts it in a state that you can run these uh, periodic proofs on. 
And so every 24 hours, it will have to come back. It goes into a state called proving. And every 24 hours, it has to prove back to the blockchain that the data exists, right? So it's currently doing that at the moment. And that'll take a, a, a few minutes for that to come through, um, that deal publication, uh, the deal confirmation to come through. Um, and we'll be able to see that shortly. While we're just waiting for that, uh, are there any questions at the moment? What's going on? How does the blockchain verify that the data has not been tampered? Right, good question. So within Filecoin, everything is referenced by a content ID, a CID. So these are these things you see here starting generally um, BA, for example, here. So these are actually hashes of the data. So when we ran that um, upload step there, we got the hash of the data, and that's what we passed to the smart contract. So the smart contract knows what the hash of the data should be. So when the storage provider goes and stores it, it then reports back to the blockchain the hash, and we can then the blockchain will then check and make sure that those match up and it hasn't been tampered with. If it has been, then the deal publication will fail. And then, like I said, once that's been done, the miner then has to, every 24 hours, answer a zero-knowledge proof sent from the blockchain to the miner to prove that it still has the data. And if it doesn't have the data, then the miner, who has to have put some collateral up, gets slashed, right? Now, in this case, when we set this all up, when we ran the Docker Compose up, it automatically gave the, uh, gave the miner some funds uh, to, to, to deal with, right? So we didn't have to manually do that. Where can you see the ZK proof? Uh, good question. You'll probably see that in boost every 24 hours when that is done. You'll see the uh, see the result of that there. Still waiting. Deal publish confirmation. So that's just still waiting there. Hopefully it'll be soon. That'll come back and then it'll start doing the sealing process um, there and you'll see that come through. Ah, oh, there we go. It's starting to starting to come through here. Um, yes, deal published, confirmed, and it's successfully confirmed. Added to checkpoint, uh, bum, 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 and it's currently sealing it. So this is the process when you get when it when a miner gets the data, it then seals the data, which is a cryptographic process that turns it into a, a format for which the proofs can then be run on it. Now. On a on the main net, like I said, storage providers are working on 32 gigabyte sectors, and the sealing process takes something in the region of four hours with a pretty hefty CPU and a pretty hefty GPU to do that. So it's a pretty intensive process. Uh, but running this locally on laptop, because we're doing two kilobyte sectors, it's it's pretty quick. So there's a question: Is there any way we can shard the data between miners to store? So what you can do, yes, you could you could shard it. Um, you can do multiple um, stores as well. So this is the thing with, with Filecoin is to get the redundancy. The redundancy is entirely up to you how much redundancy you want. So you could create multiple storage deals with multiple different miners. Now, in this case, on this local net, we've got one miner, which is the miner that was started. But you could start up multiple ones and you could negotiate, you know, each one of those could have a
Okay, just confirm I'm back again, hopefully. Yep, okay, good. Right, so um, I'm not sure when I, when I disappeared there, but there was a question about do you have to pay to retrieve data from the network? And the question is you may have to pay to retrieve data depending upon whether the miner has kept the unsealed copy of the data, whether they discard that. Now, when we uh, ran our, our command, one of the things we sent to it was this flag, whether or not to remove the unsealed copy. And so we told Boost, or we told the smart contract that in turn told Boost, that in turn told the miner to keep the unsealed copy available and do not remove it. Now, it's up to the miner whether or not they do that, but with that unsealed copy, that means we can actually retrieve the data back again. Uh, if not, then they would have to unseal the data to get it back again afterwards, which the miner may choose to charge you for as well, right? So, okay, so that's that stored, um, and that is stored on the Filecoin network now. So the final step to do here is let's show retrieving the data back from the network. So I'm going to use a tool called Lassie to do that. And uh, Lassie, let's see here if I've got it open already. Um, maybe I do, maybe I don't. Uh, yeah, I think I do here. So uh, right, so I can run uh, this command Lassie, Lassie fetch. And Lassie is a tool that can fetch data from either IPFS or Filecoin. And it uses a thing called the um, IP, uh, IPNI, the Interplanetary Network Indexer, to get the data. But because we're running this locally on my laptop, IPNI doesn't know anything about it. So we need to tell it what the provider is. So that's what this address is here. Um, that's the address of the provider. And what I need is just the ID here. And I can actually get that from the boost logs here. They should be in here in the boost logs. Um, there should be at the top something about a uh, PNP address. Uh, I'll try and find it. If we get it wrong, it'll tell me it'll tell me what the correct one should be. So uh, let's see here. I think it's this address here. Let's copy that. So I will put that on the end there. And we need the CID of what we want to fetch. So go back into boost here and we can see here the um, root data CID. That's the one we want. So if I copy that, put that there, then when I run this command, uh, I can't see the shared screen. Can somebody else just confirm that the screen is sharing? Um, yes, we can see your screen. Okay. 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 Um, right. So when I run this, hopefully this should now fetch the data and it's actually going to use a, um, a protocol called BitSwap to download the data from our miner. So if I run that, uh, no peer IDs, I've got the wrong peer ID. So let me just change that. Like I said, it tells you when you get it wrong. Um, there's two different ones and I've obviously picked the wrong one out of those log files. So let me just change that. Uh, change that peer ID there. Right. Now let's clear the screen and run that again. And it has fetched the data, right? So it's fetched the data. It's um, downloaded this file here. If I do an LS, you'll see there's this car file named after the CID. Now I need to unpack that. And there's a tool called IPFS car. Um, and I can unpack it. Like I said, a bit like unzipping a file there. So if I do that, it will unpack it. Now, if I look here, you'll see there's a directory named after that. And if I go into that directory and do an ls, videojam.txt. And if I run that, there we go. So that's the file that we stored in Filecoin. So we've gone full circle there, running everything locally and, and playing both parts of the client and of the storage provider, right? So we... Let me just recap here. Uh, where is my presentation? Is it still up here? No, it's not. One second. Uh, video jam.
So we cloned the FEM local net repo. We brought up the Docker images using Docker Compose up to bring up a new network. And like I said, when you first start that, it will need to download about three gigabytes of data for a, a 2K sector network. We used Hardhat to deploy uh, the deal client contract to local net. Um, oh, we actually gave ourselves some funds as well. Uh, that's a step I've, I've missed out there. We gave ourselves some funds. We ran that Lotus, uh, first of all, Lotus exec uh, EVM stack to get the convert from the MetaMask wallet address, a 0x address to a T4 address. And then we used uh, Lotus send to send some funds. And then we deployed a contract. Uh, once we had some funds in our wallet, we deployed a contract using hard hat. Um, and that's from the hard hat starter kit on the Filecoin project repository. We then invoked that deal contract. Uh, we, we stored some data in the um, Lighthouse data repository that gave us all the parameters we needed for that command. Uh, we then invoked that contract. We plugged those parameters in, invoked that contract, that contacted the local blockchain, told it what we wanted to store, the local blockchain then emitted an event to Boost. Boost saw that, went and fetched the data and confirmed that everything was okay. We went into Boost and clicked Publish Storage Deal. That then told the blockchain, yes, we're going to store all of that. And then at the very end, we fetched the data with Lassie. And I probably see if we go back here, let's look at this data right down the bottom here, uh, proving. We're now in the proving state, right? So that means we're now at the final state for our data. This is where the miner has to prove every 24 hours that it has the data. And if not, it'll have its um, funds slashed there. We'll probably cover some of this stuff again. And he'll probably, he might use this same local net setup, or he might do it on hyperspace. I'm not sure which he's going to use yet. Um, but he'll recover some of this stuff as well. So definitely come along to that. Uh, thing there. So there's a question about why did we use Lighthouse? So we didn't use Lighthouse in the normal sense of Lighthouse. What we used is a is a is a tool that Lighthouse have called the data dashboard uh, or the data onboarding tool. Now the only reason we use that is because we need to convert our uh, text file, in this case videojam.txt, into a car file to be uploaded. And there's a few steps to do that. And like I said, you can do it manually. And the details are actually in the, um, there's a client contract. Uh, where is it here? This one? Uh, no, within here, within the Filecoin repository, there is a another repository. Falcon starter kit deal making. And in the README there, it gives you, it tells you how to do the data prep step, right? So you can do it yourself DIY. Um, you know, locally, you can, there's some commands or package the data up as a car file and bring you back a JSON file that has all that information there. So the reason we just used that Lighthouse site was just for convenience to do it quickly because it formats it all nicely. Um, that was that was the only reason, uh, but otherwise you can use the uh, you you can you can do it locally. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? If not, uh, I'll say thanks very much uh, for letting me come and present to you. I'm really looking forward to see what you create as part of this hackathon. I think. The combination of Filecoin and video is just such a natural combination because video naturally is very, you know, substantially large amounts of data and a Filecoin is designed for storing that data. So uh, that's great. And I really look forward to seeing what you build. Uh, all right, Matt. Matt uh, I think uh, there are no further questions from our participants over here. So thank you so much for, for this amazing workshop and thank you builders for joining and you can join us tomorrow again at the same time 8 p.m. IST for our next workshop uh, which is going to be about storing meeting recordings on Huddle 01 using FVM 
and yeah uh, if you have any questions uh, please feel free to drop drop them on our discord and we have developers available around the clock to help you out with anything you might need during the hackathon and yes looking forward to what you build uh, during the hackathon and we'll wait for your submissions uh, there's one last uh, question in the chat Matt if you could please answer that and then we'll wrap things up are there any projects dealing with databases uh, there are some not so much dealing with Filecoin in FEM at the moment. Um, there's a project, um, oh, what is it? There's a database project called... Tableland. Tableland, that's the one, yeah. All I could think of was their, their little NFT project called Rigs. Uh, but there's a project called Tableland, and they're doing some stuff. And I, I do know they're working on some stuff with Filecoin and, and FEM, so keep an eye out for them. Uh, at the moment, they, they do stuff with IPFS. Um, they do some NFT stuff, um, some smart contract stuff. But uh, very soon, they will be um, hopefully talking about what they're doing with, with FEM as well. So keep keep an ear out for them, table land. Brilliant. Okay, Great. Then, yeah, that's well, it, I guess. Thank you so much thanks for the job. Yeah. No problem. Thanks a lot, all. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Good night.